And we begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And g'day. Now, before we look at the interesting narrative in Judges, we need to understand that Judges doesn't mean dudes wearing white wigs and flowing black robes presiding over a courtroom to ultimately decide who is guilty. In the 300 or so time period of the Judges, God called these people to actively govern a local area within Israel, including using warfare to rescue God's people from their enemies' tyranny and to put into action God's judgment on both the Israelites and the enemies. So we should see them more as people God called to not only govern and warn his people to stop going off the rails and return to following God, but to also deliver the Israelites from the slavery and oppression of God's enemies. And with that in mind, today we are looking at two chapters in Judges. Chapter 4's brisk factual narrative, combined with Chapter 5's emotive poetry, praising God as both help us get the full picture of the events. And the other thing we need to understand is that the author of Judges hasn't set out to give a comprehensive history of that time period. But instead, he has highlighted how each judge's declining moral integrity mirrors the deterioration in Israel's ability to follow God's ways. And today's reading is set at the halfway down the downhill slide from the good moral judges. From now on, the judges' declining moral standards gradually increases until their morality hits rock bottom. And so what we find in chapters 4 and 5 is this group of diverse people revealing their moral failings and strengths, with a working woman and a stay-at-home mother taking centre stage in the narrative. Yes, you heard right, women. And yet I have heard umpteen times that because the Old Testament rarely mentions females, they weren't considered that important in the grand scheme of life. But I am beginning to wonder, is that really, truly true? For there are many times in the Old Testament where we find women are valued and God using women to achieve victory. But what we modern people need to understand is that back then, culturally, the majority of females had no desire or need to give up their lifestyle as a mother. Why would you, when everyone thought the role mothers had in training and bringing up her children was the most valuable job you could have. And in some ways, it was considered even more important than the hard yucca of the men. For it was considered that the mother had the best chance of instilling a love of God and his moral virtues in her children. And naturally, because it was the normal status quo of life, The Bible doesn't mention women. Well, actually, for that matter, everyday hard-working men aren't mentioned either. And even in the time of judges, there may have been other good moral men or women judging an area in Israel that were edited out of the book to keep the lesson within the book short and sweet. So everyone would read and learn the moral of the whole book. And the author has started this section by giving his audience the background events that lead into the narrative's gripping drama as chapter 4 verses 1 to 3 inform us that after Ehud died, The Israelites once again did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, a king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. 
The commander of his army was Sedaria. He had 900 iron chariots and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. And as the narratives just give us nothing but the fact that Israel had rejected living under God's moral laws. And so the consequence was Caesarea and his huge chariot army had dominated and ruled over them for 20 long years. Whereas in chapter 5 song, verses 6, 7 and 30, we are told just how awful the situation really was with, in the days of Yael, the main ways were deserted because travellers kept to the side roads. Villages in Israel were deserted. Sisera and his soldiers raping the women. There can be no doubt about it. Sisera and his army were not the good guys. And as a perfect foil to the Israelite women who are faithfully attempting to instill God's moral virtues in their children, Verse 30 tells us how Caesarea's mother bragged about Caesarea's delay in coming home with the rich plunder he was steal from the impoverished Israelites to give to her was due to him and his men raping the women. I don't know about you, but I am finding it hard living in reasonable safety to imagine what it was like for the Israelites who had for 20 long years been experiencing economic hardship with the enemy blocking their ability to trade, the constant fear, hiding from the intense, never-ending, increasing brutality and vicious, indiscriminate murders and rapes committed by the bully Caesarea and his army. And what compounded their miserable situation was that they, as the song says in verse 8, had chosen new gods. Now, as we know, or if you are a new Christian, will now know, the first commandment God gave the Israelites and everyone who believes in him ever since, which is found in Exodus 20 verse 3, says, You shall have no other gods before me. And then later on, when Israel was about to enter the Promised Land, God had strictly warned them in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 30 to 31, to not fall into the trap of wanting to know how do these nations worship their gods? I'm going to do the same. Therefore, the Israelites, knowing they had done exactly what God had told them not to do, couldn't blame anyone other than themselves for the terrible situation they were in. And so you expect them to seek forgiveness and change their way. But no, the narrative bluntly informs us that the Israelites cried to the Lord for help. And shouldn't this be a great comfort for any modern Christians who have backslidden and are no longer living wholeheartedly following God and Jesus, like you first did. For the Israelites, despite knowing how bad their sinful living was, and so they were getting what they deserved in God's consequences, could still cry out to God. And so shouldn't we modern Christians who have the assurance of Jesus' salvation, when we find ourselves falling away from following God, be able to, even more confidently than the Israelites did, cry out to God for help. And if you have read the whole book of Judges, you will know that this has been a consistent behavioural pattern. There is the moral judge and the people follow God, living good, moral, upright lives. Life is good. The people turn their backs on God and start behaving badly and with each time there is this ever increasing downward slide towards sinful living and so life is bad and as they suffer the consequences and then wake up to themselves and cry out to God for help and he answers them and did you notice something interesting in their cry to God for help 
there is no mention of asking God to forgive them. No bargaining, no making false promises of changed behaviour to get God to act. Perhaps that was because they knew that God was always waiting, waiting for his people to realise they have stuffed up and cry out to him for help. Or perhaps because their situation was so hopeless, it would take a miracle to get them out of this mess. And so they were crying out to God without much expectation that God could or would even want to help them. But chapter 5, verse 8, describes just how bad it had got with War is in the gates, not a shield or spear is seen amongst 40,000 in Israel. Talk about being up shit creek without a paddle. There was literally no weapons in all of Israel. And the enemy not only had a fully armed infantry, they also had 900 iron chariots. If bets were being taken, no one would bet on Israel winning any battle, let alone against Caesarea's mighty army and chariots. Their situation was impossible. There's no way God could help them. And yet, they still called for help, hanging on to the faint hope that God could do what they couldn't do on their own strength, rescue them from the consequences of their unbearable, immoral, sinful life. And then chapter 4's narrative in verses 4 to 5 keeps its audience on its toes by not adding a hero male judge like the previous judges, but instead adding an influential female judge to the drama. Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites came to her to have their disputes decided. And in Deborah's victory song, chapter 5, verses 7 and 9, we learn more about her and how until I, Deborah, a mother in Israel, arose. My heart is with the leaders of Israel, with the volunteers of the people. Praise the Lord. Now, a couple of things you may have picked up from the reading about Deborah. One is that she called herself a mother. Now, as this is a song, she could be using mother poetically to describe how she was perceived as a mother figure by the Israelites as they came to her with their moral and legal problems. But as was said earlier, being a mother gave you higher status amongst their culture, for it was a mother's duty to install moral virtues in her children. Therefore, it could be safely assumed that Deborah was referring to both herself as a working mother and a mother figure training God's people how to live according to God's moral laws. And secondly, with her role as prophetess listed before the fact she is married, this tells us her role as prophetess is the most important piece of information on her CV. Deborah, being a prophetess and judge, had been chosen by God to let his wayward children know how to live morally in God's eyes. And at times, to use her mum voice as she told them, Hey, quit your immoral behaviour. Start obeying God's commands or else he will. From this, we get a picture of a good, upright woman who was not just a mother figure in the way she judged her area of jurisdiction, but how her powerful positions of well, what today we would designate as female prime minister, high court judge and commander in chief of the army gave her considerable authority over the district. And therefore, as verses 6 to 7 show, she expected to be obeyed as she summoned Barak, telling him, The Lord God of Israel commands you, go, 
take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulon and lead them to Mount Tabor. God will lure Sisar, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River and give him into your hands. And most commentators showing their preconceived viewpoint that women were considered insignificant believe Deborah commanding Barak would have surprised the original readers. But did it? She was a well-known prophetess. Seriously, she had a tree named after her. So it's like us modern people naming landmarks like bridges or roads, etc. after important people in our area or country. Back then, it was large landmark trees. Today, she would be called an influencer. And Deborah had been taking her mother role a step further by guiding and helping all of God's people in the area to live moral lives under God. And the other thing is that there is no sense of surprise in the ensuing conversation as Barak replies with, If you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. And from Barak's response, most commentators write him off as a weak, timid leader, failing in his moral duty to lead the army, who responds to God's command by stamping his foot stipulating his acceptance upon this one requirement being met. Deborah, you have to go with me, otherwise I ain't going. But that doesn't make sense when you look at Deborah's song after the battle and how she bags out the tribes of Reuben, Dan and Asher for not joining in the battle. And how in verse 12 she proclaims, Awake, awake Deborah, awake! Awake, sing a song. Arise, Barak, and take hold of your captives. The word awake is conveying the picture of Deborah opening her eyes from sleep to sing. And then she pictures Barak as establishing God's victory by rising up to receive the enemy captives. The original audience would have had this picture of Barak sitting like the kings of the other nations did as the captains led the captives before them and the king then standing up to declare their fate. Why do some modern people find it hard to consider that Barak was a true servant of God who, like John the Baptist did with Jesus, was willing to put himself in the background for God? God to achieve his aim of destroying the heartless enemy Caesarea. Why do modern men and women find it hard to believe that Barak didn't have a woman shouldn't go to war and fight attitude? Or that perhaps he was looking back to the past victories under that great general Joshua and had remembered how the Israelite priests and Ark had led the army across the Jordan River. Therefore, having God's prophetess join the army would inspire the army to win and bring glory to God. And Deborah responds with, Well, if I go, the credit's going to go to a woman and not you. And Barak is willing to give credit where credit is due. After all, why not let Deborah, as God's representative, get all the glory with God? And so Barak happily accepts the deal that Deborah will get the credit for the victory. And off they go with 10,000 men up the mountain to wait for God to draw Caesarea to them. Caesarea arrives with his vast army probably feeling like Ned Kelly, invincible with his 900 iron chariots. There was no way he would be defeated against the backward Israeli infantry who had no real weapons. And with the battle line set up, Deborah dramatically sends the army to the battlefield, commanding Barak, go, this is the day the Lord has given Caesarea into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? And off they go, Barak and the 10,000 men, back down the mountain to meet Caesarea 
and his chariots. And the narrative gives God the glory with, at Barak's advance, the Lord routed Caesarea and all his chariots and the army by the sword. And Caesarea abandoned his chariot and fled on foot. But Barak pursued the chariots and army as far as Harasheth Hagoyim. All the troops of Caesarea fell by the sword. Not a man was left. Caesarea hadn't counted on God, throwing his normally well-trained army into confusion. Panic sets in and they run for their lives. But that basic, just the facts description, leaves you questioning, uh, excuse me, why? What happened to cause this invincible army to panic? Why didn't they just turn the chariots around and flee in them? Wouldn't that be a whole lot quicker and easier than hoofier on foot? And Deborah's song is helpful as it answers our questions by giving us a powerful picture of what happened that day. Firstly, with the dramatic arrival of the army, which not only consisted of Caesarea and his huge army and chariots, for the kings of Canaan came to fight too. But they were no match for Israel's God, the Lord of heavenly hosts, who had the stars in heaven fighting against them. And then the God of creation caused the earth to shake, mountains quaked, the heavens and clouds poured rain, the ancient river Kishon swept them away, the unexpected earthquake and storm causing the sudden flash flooding of the river would have bogged the chariot's wheels, making them useless. And then Deborah's song vividly describes this noisy, chaotic scene with the horse's hoofs hammered, the galloping, galloping of his stallions. This is a great picture of the horses, as horses do, galloping wildly in any and every direction to escape the danger of the rapidly rising river. And what is interesting is that neither the narrative or the song give any indication that the Israelite army did anything except to start marching down the hill to fight. Instead, all they ended up doing was pursuing the fleeing enemy. And in the narrative, we see Caesarea showing his true colours as he deserts his army and flees on foot like all bullies he is a gutless coward when the tables are turned. But in Caesarea's case, it is even worse. As king, it is his moral duty to stay on the battlefield and fight to the death with his men. The battle is won by the death of the opposition's king or leader. It is then that the rest of the army can leave the field. When Caesarea fled, so did the army, giving the Israelites the easy job of mopping up the stragglers as they chased them all the way back to their town. And by then, there was no one in Caesarea's army left to fight another day. But Caesarea was still on the run, meaning that technically the battle hadn't been won. And so for the next Bible reading, I am going to combine the narrative and song as we follow Caesarea, who flees the battle on foot to the tent of Yael, the wife of Heba, the Kenite, because there were friendly relations between King Jabin of Hazor and Heba, the Kenite's clan. Yael, who is the most blessed among tent-dwelling women, went out to meet Caesarea saying to him, My Lord, come in, don't be afraid. He entered her tent and she put a covering over him. He said, Please give me some water, I'm thirsty. She opened a skin of curdled milk, giving him drink from a majestic bowl and covered him up. He commanded, Stand in the doorway of the tent and if someone comes by and asks you, Is anyone here? Say, No. But Yael reached for a tent peg and with her right hand for a hammer 
and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. She hammered the peg through his temple into the ground, crushing his head. She shattered and pierced his temple. He collapsed, falling at her feet, dead. Now, while all that sounds gruesome and awful, when you take into account the way Caesarea had killed people, it could be counted as a nicer death than he deserved. The curdled milk would have had a slight anaesthetic effect, pardon me, which on top of his tiredness from fleeing the battlefield would have zonked him out. And Yael was an expert at hitting pegs for one of her jobs was to drive the tent pegs into the ground whenever they set up camp. She would have had the strength and know-how to quickly and expertly drive the tent peg straight into his temple. And so, aside from a quick millisecond of pain, Caesarea may not have felt any more pain. For as Dr. Gregory Zipfel, a top neurosurgeon explains, while your brain has neurons that sense and feel pain to your skin and its surrounding tissues, you can't feel any injury to the brain itself. Caesarea would have had an instantaneous death. It happened so quickly, he was unaware that death had come. The description in the song of him collapsing at Deborah's feet is likely describing the final twitching and throwing around of the nerves as they catch up to the fact that he is dead. A bit like a chook still running around after its head is chopped off. What I found interesting when reading the commentaries is how in the past 20 years or so, people have started to say that Yael was morally wrong by acting deceptively inviting Caesarea into a tent with the intent of killing him. Hmm. Are they expecting to politely say, oh, by the way, Caesarea, you are a big, mean, ugly, vicious bully who is much bigger and stronger than me, and I reckon the world would be a much better place without you in it. So could you do me the favour and come in so I can remove the oxygen thief that you are from the world? Mm, I don't think that would have worked in her favour, do you? Whereas in the previous generations, no one really questioned the morality of Yael's actions. For starters, she had not made plans to kill Caesarea. She had just been going about her normal daily routine when he rocked up at her tent door, exhausted from fleeing the battle. And so she was given this window of opportunity and had to quickly decide whether she should kill Caesarea if the chance arose, or should she choose to let a brutal, sadistic man live, who, as she was well aware from Caesarea's past actions, would continue to viciously kill innocent children and people, and who even his mother believed that with Caesarea, raping was a foregone conclusion. Then he would have continued to callously, brutally rape and destroy women. And this knowledge has caused some people to suggest that Yael killed Caesarea in revenge for raping her. And it's possible with some of the innuendo conveyed in the Hebrew words. But the Bible has never, ever been squeamish about mentioning brutal, cruel rapes committed by God's people. So why would the author suddenly be silent about a rape by the mortal enemy of God's people, Caesarea, when surely it would help emphasize just how morally corrupt and evil Caesarea really was in raping someone who was giving him Safety. And also, while Deborah's song didn't leave out any of the blood and guts details of Caesarea's death, she too made no mention or even a poetic allusion to rape. 
Therefore, it appears unlikely that Yael killed Caesarea in revenge. Well, in a sense she did, but not for personal revenge, which would have been morally wrong. Instead, she has acted in the only way feasibly possible to remove a completely wicked, cold-blooded, immoral, mortal enemy of God's people, who if he was left to live would continue destroying women's lives and brutally murdering people, along with many other horrific, violent acts like child sacrifice. Yael understood that the death of this one man, Caesarea, would save the lives of many innocent children and people, as well as preventing numerous women from being brutally raped. And under God's laws, and most Western countries' laws up to the past hundred years, Caesarea deserved the death penalty. Yael had no thought of getting fame and attention. All she desired to see was God's justice swiftly carried out upon this immoral, evil man. And so Barak rocks up to discover Yael has killed Caesarea. And there is no hint in either the narrative or the song that Barak felt put out that it wasn't Deborah, the important, well-known female, that he had expected God to hand Caesarea over to, as she had predicted. But instead, a foreign housewife had been given the privilege of removing the evil Caesarea. And the narrative finishes by letting the audience know that on that day God subdued Jabin, the Canaanite king, before the Israelites, and the hand of the Israelites grew stronger and stronger against Jabin until they destroyed him. And the song finishes with the post note, and the land was peaceful 40 years. And so Yael, in using her everyday skills and tools to kill Caesarea, had saved countless people from goodness knows how many more years of misery and hopeless darkness. They were now free to live and enjoy life again under God's laws. And to join in with Deborah's prayer in verse 31 and praises in verse 33. Lord, may all your enemies perish as Caesarea did, and may those who love you, Lord, be like the rising of the sun in its strength. I will sing to the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. Now, before you rush off thinking this narrative is saying all Christians should go and drive a tent peg in wicked people's temples, well, no, just no. Caesarea was the most vile, wicked, immoral person amongst the nation that prided itself on its pure, evil deeds. Fair dinkum, it sounds like it was trying to outdo Sodom and Gomorrah in wickedness. And so you could, though, look at whether God might be calling you to be like Deborah, a mother figure who is to train God's people in how to live, imaging God by teaching them how to live moral, good lives. Or perhaps you think you could be asked to be a Barak, someone who is willing to give up being the hero for the other person to get the praise and glory. Or will you be a Yael who has happily lived in the background with no desire for fame and yet God gives you a once in a lifetime chance to do something that will bring glory to God and in doing so also experience your moment of glory and praise. And yet hopefully you remember that is not the reason this event was recorded for prosperity. For what we also need to be looking at is the bigger picture that the author wants us to get, which is are you, as one of God's people, mirroring the moral decay in the society around you and in doing so leading God's people further down the slippery slope of sin and immorality? Or are you like Deborah, Barak and Yael, 
standing apart from the crowd, showing God's people in your corner of the world that there is a better way as they watch you image God in the way you are living a moral, upright life. And so they will copy you, copying God, and everyone's lives will be the better for it for years to come. Amen.